Before we get started, I do want to I do want to acknowledge that we are meeting on Duwamish lands, and the Freedom Socialist Party and Radical Women have been involved in both local and national um, struggles for Native American rights. So, with that, I want to introduce our speakers. The first is Gina Petrie. She went representing Radical Women, a multiracial and multi-issue group dedicating to fighting for women's liberation and dedicated to developing women's leadership. She's a queer activist and the organizer in Seattle, and she's led many campaigns um, to tax the rich and fund human resources, services, She's organized rallies in defense of abortion rights, and she has also confronted neo-Nazis locally. Patrick Burns went representing the Freedom Socialist Party, which is a socialist feminist revolutionary party. He's a retired union carpenter who is also on the steering committee of ALS, Organized Workers for Labor Solidarity, which is a cross-union group of militant rank and filers. In addition to supporting labor strikes, ALS is also taking the fight to the Freedom Foundation, a right-wing think tank, whose stated goal is to defund and bankrupt public employee unions. We'll be hearing from both of them. They'll be going back and forth. There'll be some pictures, some videos, and then after their presentation, we'll have a discussion um, and then conclude. So go ahead, Gina. Okay, well thank you all for being here. Um, very happy and excited to show, share this information with you. Um, I just want to start out by saying I was very proud to be asked and to be able to go to Standing Rock. Um, it really was an, an invigorating experience that is, is unlike any other that I've been part of. When, uh, when youth heard about plans to reroute the Dakota Access Pipeline away from Bismarck and through tribal <laughs> land, they took action. As part of the Standing Rock Youth, a group of about 30 people from the Standing Rock Sioux community did an online petition and organized relay races uh, from North Dakota to Nebraska, and then later did one to Washington, D.C. I was gonna say only young people can run from North Dakota to Washington. <laughs> More power to them, absolutely. Um, and the youth quickly began working with Native women um, to build the action. So I knew that these were the leaders that I wanted to meet. Um, so I talked a little bit about the International Indigenous Youth Council. Um, I interviewed and we spent some time with, with the council. It was founded by a young woman named uh, Jocelyn Charger and it's for native youth ages 17 to 29, I believe. So if you're 30, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, it's, it's both women and men um, who are part of the council, but really I saw women especially taking charge at the, you know, running the meetings and, and at the actions. Um, they're a real leadership voice and a force within Standing Rock. Um, they're, organi they're organized and they take their role very seriously. They have been taught that they are the seventh generation. They are those who will protect the earth and resources for the next seven generations. So they have they have organized many actions over the months and have been on the front lines. Um, so I'd like for them to just be able to speak for themselves, a couple of the members. I want to show a couple of the video clips from my interview with uh, youth council members. The first one is uh, young man Alex Goodcane Milk, and the second is uh, Tashina Tish Sapawin. Um, and I just want to say before we show the videos that um, when Tashina saw a copy of the Freedom Socialist newspaper, which at the top says, Voice of Revolutionary Feminism, she said, if this interview is for feminism, then hell yes, I'll do it. <laughs> I knew I found a good person there, so we'll show the video clips. Uh, that we are with you, and uh, we are your voice, that you're not heard. We are here for not only you, but your future, your children, that's what we do it for. So we can see the whole picture, the whole reality. And, uh, it's, you know, I'm just that and smell through and people and so that colonized mind, you know, they may not think it, but it's very real, colonization is very real. If you don't think you are, you have it. 
And we're just economizing. If we can't change and she expose to you the truth and you can't see it, show your children, say to them, you're not supposed to live like that. And just pay bills and die. What we have here at this camp is how life should be. All you gotta do is pull your weight around camp and then you can be taken care of. First time I got here is like war had been felt. I was at home.
one-sided war where we are doing nothing but using, like I said several times, using our voices and then to have on the other side guns cocked, batons ready, mace canisters ready, and it's a scary thing, but it's that, it's that fear that we need to take and transform it into courage. And that's what a lot of our warriors used to say, take courage. And they said it to our whole, our whole people for getting ready for war. that we can add about the Youth Council, um, so feel free to ask in discussion. Um, and we also did give the Youth Council our banner, uh, which they were thrilled to receive. So, um, so I just want to say a little bit more about um, some of the other interviews that I did. Uh, so in addition to the Youth Council, I interviewed um, Native and non-Native women who are coordinating the Midwifery Collective, which is part of the Standing Rock Healer and Medic Council. Um, and I really learned a lot in talking to these women. Um, it was founded by and is led by Native women to respond to needs of women and children at the camp, um, but they also really want to build a network outside of camp. Um, and all of the women that I interviewed want to change the, the state of the inadequate <coughs> medical, medical care that Native women receive and really strengthen the role of uh, Indigenous midwifery. And I was shocked to learn that there are only 15 known practicing indigenous midwives in the U.S. Um, the women in the collective really view the pipeline as a further assault against the reproductive rights of indigenous women. They said it's not just about this pipeline, but all pipelines and all resource contamination that has happened. So, um, so not only were women taking the lead in the Youth Council, Midwif Midwifery Collective, but many other areas too. Um, there was a picture earlier of the banner of Two-Spirit Camp, and I uh, interviewed the woman Candy Brings Plenty, who is uh, coordinating the Two-Spirit Camp. And Two-Spirit, people may not know, is an umbrella term that's used by some indigenous people to describe gay, lesbian, bisexual, and gender variant individuals. So she's not only looking to fulfill um, you know, needs at the camp, but really bringing visibility to what she says is an often overlooked issue with the Native communities. So that's a little bit about interviews, and now I'd like to um, talk about the ceremony, which is how many, not all, but many of the water protectors refer to actions that are done. Um, a ceremony that was led by the uh, Indigenous Youth Council. And in this, we called for the release of the um, uh, Lakota tribal member Red Fawn Fallis, um, who has been wrongly charged with firing at police and, and with attempted murder. Uh, police arrested her on October 27th during a raid on a short-lived um, 1851 treaty camp. And according to her family, um, she was serving as a trained medic uh, at, that, at that action. Um, to treat those who have been injured in the confrontation. And at some point during this, um, three officers tackled her and threw Red Fawn to the ground, alleging that she had tried to shoot them. Um, one officer pulled his weapon and placed it against her back. So however, water protectors are contesting this allegation with video footage and eyewitness accounts. And on November 28th, um, the state's attempted murder charges against her were dropped, but now she faces federal charges of a possession of a firearm. Um, by, she's a convicted felon, so they're now putting federal charges on her, um, and that could land her in, to prison for up to 10 years. So this quote by her uncle, now she, she is, um, I wanna just throw in here, she and her family have been long time, um, she's an organizer with the American Indian Movement, and her family has strong roots in that. And, um, I think this quote by her uncle really sums up why she was picked out. They recognize her leadership as a young indigenous woman who's a lot, who a lot of younger indigenous people looked up to, for example, in leadership. So that identifies her as a target in their mind. So at the ceremony for Red Fawn, um, the picture that was before, you know, where you saw the razor wire, um, that, that was the bridge that, that we were on. So, um, <clears throat> 
So after, you know, there were speeches about, about what was going on and really taking photos with drones to, to raise awareness about her case. Um, so after that happened, we proceeded to the bridge that was barricaded by not only, well, it's razor wire, um, and armored vehicles and cops. And I, people may have seen some of the pictures. Uh, it's a pretty, I mean, it's a completely armed, blocked bridge. Um, and this, it's blocked because it's the access point to the drilling. Um, and at this, at this particular uh, ceremony, Native women encouraged all women to, to stand up and become leaders, stand with their brothers and with everyone who was fighting back. And we occupied the bridge in silence for about a half hour. And as we dispersed from the bridge, after the cops, I mean, the minute you walk on the bridge, you can see coming down the hill, you can see all the cop cars streaming down because they know something is about to happen. So, so here's, here's the bridge and there's a hill that goes up and the cops just start, you know, pouring down anytime people set foot on the bridge. Um, so as we dispersed from that bridge, uh, some of the water protectors were saying, you know, out loud to the cops, thank you and we love you. Um, but at this point, there was at least, at least one Native man who said, why are people saying we love you to the cops? We know the cops don't love us. <laughs> Which is very true. Um, and this is really where I saw the firsthand division in, within the camp. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, talk and, you know, belief in unity, but there's not, that doesn't mean everyone is unified in their opinion. Um, about how to proceed, uh, how to stop the pipeline, or, or, or an orientation to the cops. I mean, that um, came up in the community meeting that I was talking about earlier, too, and you know, people had talked about some folks who had been arrested, and um, some people were there who had been arrested and were released, and they said, you know, they really were trying while they were there, um, being held in jail to win over the cops and appeal to them, and, you know, um, they, we really need to push them to do the right thing. And, um, and there was a, a woman at the meeting who said, you know, if an individual cop wants to turn in his badge, you know, we would welcome that. That's a great thing. But let's not fool ourselves that things can turn with the cops at any minute, and they have. Um, so, you know, I mean, that, that kind of uh, sentiment of, of how to orient to the cops and this private security and the National Guard, I mean, that, that is, um, that there's definite division there. Um, and I just want to say here, you know, Radical Women and Freedom Socialist Party, we believe in all the Native people and all oppressed people's right to self-defense. I mean, when you're standing there facing, like Tashina said, weaponry that's, you know, or a gun that is just about 10 to 15 yards away from you, you know, I believe you have a right to defend yourself against that. So and I know some people, you know, I talked to some folks um, about this and really, you know, they agreed with that. Uh, I mean, especially given what they were seeing, the repression that they were facing. But, you know, the opinions are voiced and the discussion and debate is and, and will continue. <coughs> so um, I just wanted to say a couple more things. What I learned from my interviews and experiences is that the leadership of women and youth is really the essential component to the success of and the militancy of Standing Rock. I can see that many of the female water protectors were drawing a lot and talking a lot about the matriarchal tribal structures and really, you know, uh, drawing on, on that role. There is certainly a reverence for women for, you know, connection to life and protecting the water. And for a lot of uh, people, that role is, you know, seen as equal. It's not uh, uh, secondary to the role that men are seen playing by a lot of people. Um, and the women of Standing Rock said they believe that humankind's right to existence comes with responsibilities to everything else on the planet. Um, Native women and youth are standing shoulder to shoulder in this fight at Standing Rock. And I was able to interview a few um, Native men, which I don't have the time to talk about, but feel free to ask them about it in discussion. So <laughs> throw any little crumbs of, of things. You can ask whatever you want. Um, but, and there's also, so with that, I would like to show, there's a next slide of photos that we can show. <coughs> so 
Right, so this is uh, the indigenous kitchen that says free red fawn. And this is coming back um, from that, the bridge. This is, that, well, it says free red fawn, and people were wearing red. This is part of the, uh, what, what they're asking people to do is wear red to raise awareness about it. That's the bridge, that's the front line of um, some of the women. And this is all from the, the action um, for Red Fawn. Now you can kind of start to see a glimpse of, of what the bridge is blocked by. And there, there's the razor wire, the armored vehicles. Um, that's one of her, uh, Red Fawn's relatives speaking. There we are, the International Indigenous Youth Council. All right, so that, that just to give a little, a little more flavor of the, of the action and you know, kind of what things look like. So now I'll turn it back over to Patrick. So I think we can leave the lights off and go ahead and run the pictures of the structures I helped build and I'll um, fill you in what happened. So I got to help, <coughs> help in, <coughs> in, excuse me. I got to help in two building efforts this for the, that week. On the first, the Tuesday we got there, I jumped into what was called the tarpy effort. And just looking at it now, I helped with the final assembly of the wood stoves. They were pre-manufactured. They were 30-gallon drums with uh, uh, manufactured components to make them into make them actually fun work as a wood stove. As you can see from the picture, uh, the tarpy is a modern version of the teepee. Instead of lodge poles, two by fours were connected to a 16-inch diameter plywood disc. The disc had a six inch diameter hole in its center to receive a stove pipe coming from the specially designed wood stove. It was designed by Paul Chilton Wagner, First Nation tribal member from Vancouver Island. He's part of the Sanish, Sanish tribe. Uh, he was able to solicit enough funds to build, uh, to build more than 50 tarpies, which included wood stoves. The wood stoves were manufactured with 30 and 30 gallon steel drums. Regretfully, there was some confusion the day I got there. There was no evidence of the human resources necessary to initiate a larger scale building campaign. Uh, and there were a few other things that were going wrong. And uh, the next day I informed the leader for the stove construction that I was going to move on to another project so I could so I could utilize my skills for the small period of time I was going to be there. I'm glad to report that in two days' time, the Tarpey Offer project took off uh, and with separate crews framing, framing the tarpies, installing crates and sheeting for floors, installing the stoves and finishing up with plasticized tent covering. The latest report from Chilton is, for, is that 47 teepees were completed. Yeah. And what they, yeah, yeah. And what they also did is the first thing they did is they went out looking for people who needed the tarpies the most, and those were the people who got the shelter. Anyway, I went off to find uh, the camp weatherization e effort and stumbled upon four young men who were in the process of building a modern day shanty. They had taken a, a, two sheets of plywood and uh, connected them to some some built some crates. And those were going to be printed, their wall framing, and so I offered my services there because it looked like they needed them. <laughs> <laughs> so what I did is I was able to convince them that they shouldn't build a yurt, but build something more that looked like a trading post. I didn't get to help them complete their shanty, but I got them off the ground. And I was left with worries throughout since I left there that how well that thing would stand up, but I got an email from from Zach telling me that they got more professional help in their training post, stands tall and proud, and is enduring the cold weather and is warm. <laughs> so the, uh, 
So what they did with it, what I, what I especially like what they did with it, with their shelter is that they shared it. They shared it with, other, they had enough room to share it with other people so that it wasn't just for them, it was for everybody in the camp. But now I want to break away, I'm not ready yet, but I'm going to break away and talk about uh, labor support for Standing Rock. And I want to first mention uh, Steve Hoffman's local, Ask Me 304. Yeah, we can turn on, we can turn on the light, light for a minute. And Steve, Steve, thank you. Would you stand up? Steve Hoffman, Steve Hoffman, donated $1,000 to Standing Rock. Report that my Carpenters Local 30 donated $250. Wow. So I met Liam Kane. He he's a he represented labor for Standing Rock. La Liam is a is a card is a card carrying labor, but has gone on to firefight. He is also a card carrying wobbly, a member of the Industrial Workers of the World. Like so many non-native supporters, he hates the blatant racism of North Dakota officials and, in, and, and energy transfer partners, and that they have thrust, thrust this ugliness upon the Sioux Nation. Liam said members of 13 different unions make up labor for Standing Rock, which include nurses represented by the United Food and Commercial Workers, attorneys represented by United Auto Workers, and carpenters rep represented by the United Brotherhood of Carpenters. Uh, the Dakota Access Pipeline was slated to go through the north of Bismarck, but the community there got concerned that if the pipe burst there, it would pollute their water supply. That alone was enough for Liam to join the water to join the water protectors and help establish uh, labor for Standing Rock. So I did get to interview Liam, and I would like you to hear his proclamation for the need of a united front. I know for me, um, really just brings home how much things really haven't changed. Like, there's still a gross disregard from the, uh, from the powerful people in this nation um, for indigenous people and right? their rights. And if there's an opportunity to make the pillars their lands um, versus actually respect their sovereignty, I think this nation always falls on the side of the and that's wrong. I think it's beautiful here to see this gathering of indigenous people resisting that and all the different people that's bringing in and showing solidarity with that. People that are doing these uh, actions and banks around the nations. Um, you know, all those different things are really bringing that together. Um, I'm really, I, this has really broadened my horizons as far as recognizing um, here, uh, elsewhere in North America, South America, where indigenous people have really been the ones who took a lead rather than wringing their hands and talking about how global warming is actually going to kill us all, you know. Um, and then having strategy sessions, indigenous people have took the lead and actually started doing something about that. And for me, coming into this, my goal was to get uh, labor, the working class, and the environmental people on the same page. And I think what I really learned here personally, um, and I, I would say this from my speaking group as well, and I've been such a revelation to others, but um, is that the indigenous people are way ahead of us in that. And it would do us well to just observe and learn from them and take, take those lessons home to us, to our struggles in our communities. And I really think there's a very powerful Ones and indigenous people are drinking and just united together and they just stabilize a very corrupt, uh, oppressive regime. You know, it's like when you can actually bring indigenous people away, their cultures, and you know, just the strength and resilience that's in there, and tie that into folks with their environmental conscience, with their things like that, folks with their, you know, their, their trade union, uh, you know, workers' struggle uh, concepts, and tie those things together. And have a united front against capitalists that are making boys you that are trying to turn steer to my heart. United front. We have, exactly. You know, we have we may have our own philosophical differences in different places, but we have our hearts. 
Sunday night, November 20th, uh, the evening of infamy. Sunday night was our last night, last day of Sunday, Sunday was our last day of camp. And instead of going to the casino uh, in the evening, we decided to eat dinner at one of the mess halls. We went from one kitchen to another, but nothing, no food was, was prepared, nothing was ready to go. So 6.30 in the evening, we were sitting there, and people began rushing by to go into the road, urging everyone around to go with them. We went, we decided to follow. Unbeknownst to us and many of the camp, a small number of water protectors had taken a semi-truck earlier in the afternoon to the bridge just north of the camp where the Morton County Police had established a, the blockade. They had tried to remove one of the burnt out vehicles that the Morton County Police had placed there as part of the blockade of the bridge. They, the water protectors did this to demonstrate the camp's need to get access to the town of Mandan. If you look at your maps, is, if you look at that map, you see Highway 1806. 1806 goes right straight to Mandan. And in Mandan, there's amenities like hospitals. Right now, instead of, instead of going straight, they have to go 10 miles, 10 miles to the west and then take another Highway 6 and they lose 20 minutes to a half an hour getting there. So the scene was chaotic. People streamed to the bridge. While many vehicles were already parked on the side of the road, it was really difficult getting there. Other vehicles were already going, were on the, already going on the, on, to the bridge, and drivers were honking. People were yelling, get off the road, we, uh, because these vehicles needed to get by. We didn't know it then, the water protectors had already been injured and needed medical care. They were acting as ambulances. Gina and I made our way uh, to a hillside overlooking the bridge. What we witnessed was, you know, absolutely absurd. Officers were spraying volumes of pepper spray on the water protectors like single engine planes spray crops. In the freezing cold, uh, uh, there was a, a fire, somebody was with, with a fire hose, actually, I don't, there was, I don't think there was a water can, but somebody had a fire, one of the officers had a water hose and poured streams of water on the water protectors like he was watering a lawn. The water, water protectors just stood there, shielding themselves as best they could, could and taking it as long as they could. I stood next to a drone operator as he captured the visual evidence of these concerted crimes against humanity. The worst I saw was one of the water protectors start to break through the razor wire, but get snagged up in, in, in it and then be drugged through it by the Morton County Police. Vehicles went back and forth carrying the wounded. It was chaos. 300 were, were reported injured and eight seriously. One of those vehicles carried Sophia Wolanski, whose arm was destroyed by an officer who purposely threw a flash grenade at her. A policeman shot Sue Z. Desba, a native woman in the eye, with a tear gas canister. She may lose an eye. The next morning we went back to camp one last time before we had to leave to get to our plane. We made our way to the medic's tents. I spoke to one medic who told me one about, about the eye, the woman who had her eye injury, and that four people had been shot in the groin. The man next to him told me his daughter was one of the victims. A moment later, she was brought into camp. Two women carried her by the shoulders. She was shuffling her feet along the best she could. She was screaming, she was crying, enduring pain to me that must have seemed eternal. A pain inflicted upon her by a Morton County police, policeman meant to terrorize her. Like most of the other injuries, this was no accident, you know, it was intentional. And I went to comfort her father afterwards. He was, you know, he, he was just kind of numb. And I, put, I put my left hand on his heart, my right hand on his back right, right behind there. 
and held him, and he bur burst out into a river of tears. You know, this is a point in time in that camp that changed everything. Do you remember in early November, President Obama <coughs> saying he was going to allow this place, this situation to play itself out? Yeah. yeah. Well, this is what playing this out looks like. As much as anyone can appreciate the Army Corps has finally denied the permit for the pipeline to proceed, it is not enough to stop the energy transfer partners to keep, keep from drilling. It is not, not enough for President Obama to let this play out into the hands of this president-elect. We know that outcome. What is necessary is the volume of commitments from those who still are at camp and saying that they intend to stay. Intend to stay. They said they said they are not leaving until Energy Transfer Partners packs up all its gear to do its dirty work somewhere else. That what is necessary for us is to put all the pressure we can on investors to withdraw, withdraw their investments in this pipeline. <laughs> Just to kind of expand on what Patrick was talking about, um, the question certainly is what you know, what next, and where to go from here. Um, the broad support for Standing Rock has continued, and I'm sure people here heard about the thousands of veterans who poured in to be the first line of defense um, for the water protectors. I think that was a really inspiring show of solidarity. Um, that's really important. Um, and just, you know, more specifically, uh, the decision last week uh, by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers stating that it will not grant access um, for energy transfer partners to cross Lake um, Hawaii, uh, which that is the final piece that's needed um, to complete the pipeline. So they de denied access to that. So instead, the Corps said they will be undertaking an environmental <coughs> impact study and look at possible alternative routes. So there is, there is an important victory in this. Um, you know, the fact that the U.S. Army Corps denied this access to energy transfer partners, but, you know, they're not talking about, I mean, they're not really saying the pipeline needs to completely be shut down. Um, but the pressure is working, so it's important to keep that up. Um, and following this decision by the U.S. Army Corps, um, people may have read Standing Rock uh, Tribal Chairman encouraged everyone to leave camp um, as soon as the weather allows. Um, and you know, he said, even if Energy Transfer Partners continues drilling towards federal lands in an effort to provoke campers, he said that while this phase of the struggle relies largely on the water protectors at camp, this next stage will be focused on legal battles and keeping that current decision in place. So, uh, there, so a piece of uh, more current news is there was a hearing on Friday, December 9th, in which the lawyers for Energy Transfer Partners pressed, uh, pressed the, for the company's case in federal courts to allow them to finish their drilling. Um, the U.S. District Judge, who was uh, over the hearing, you know, basically kicked it down the road and said the Energy Transfer Partners has until January 31st, 2017 to give their evidence of why a permit should be granted for drilling under Lake Oahu. Um, right. uh, the Standing Rock uh, Sioux Tribe and the Army Corps then have 10 days to respond to this. So a court date is expected to rule in February. Energy Transfer Partners said they need this process expedited immediately because they are losing $20 million per week. Yay! $20 million per week. So the judge, when, you know, when, they, when they appealed about all the money they're losing, the judge basically said, that's not my problem. <laughs> you shouldn't have built it to near completion without the full permits. So Energy Transfer Partners contract with investors uh, Current contract does end on January 2nd. So up until that point, the investors can, and they can pull out, they can pull out their money at any time and should. Um, but you know, despite what's going on in the courts, uh, there are reports from a recent drone video that shows that energy transfer partners
continues to do digging on the site, despite not having the permit. So this is not really a surprise. Um, so this is really a critical time, and I know there is much discussion and debate about the tactics of defeating the pipeline um, once and for all, and many Native leaders uh, at the camp who don't agree with the chairman's statement that everybody should go home. Um, several have come out strongly saying that they are committed, you know, as Patrick was talking about, committed to staying, and that they do not trust the government to stop the pipeline. Or that they won't actually keep the water safe, or they're not going to recognize treaty rights, because when have they ever done any of that? Um, so I agree, I mean, I agree with them completely, and especially after what we saw at Standing Rock. So right now, the weather is very cold and dangerous. Um, I was on a conference call this past week where several of the leaders were asking people to not come to camp um, because, because of how dangerous the weather is. Um, but they are asking for continued support of the water protectors who are staying on the front lines. Um, and you know, some folks on that call said, you know, we have successfully halted the pipeline administratively, but really need to continue to fight it on all fronts. Um, in addition to supporting the protectors who stay who are on the front lines, there's continued push uh, to pressure the banks who are invested. Um, to withdraw their money, such as Wells Fargo, U.S. Bank, Bank of America, and many others. Um, and there's a website, defunddapple.org, that lists all the banks. Defunddapple.org. So in addition to that, I would say Obama needs to act right now. He needs to clear out the National Guard and stop the assaults on the water protectors. The federal government has a responsibility to honor Native treaty rights, respect tribal lands, and stop the black snake. And especially I'm looking at you, Democratic Party, if you're listening. <laughs> um, and the charges against the 500 water protectors who have been arrested really must be dropped. And Ob Obama needs to pardon Red Fawn Ballas. Um, and he has the power to do that uh, now, especially that she's facing federal charges. After experiencing inhumane and degrading treatment, dropping the charges against the water protectors and pardoning the Red Fawn would be an acknowledgement of everything that has been faced. And passing this pipeline issue to President-elect Trump is particularly dangerous because I'm sure we all know he completely supports the pipeline. He's invested in it, he's not, who really knows what's actually going on, but he does support it. And many water protectors that I talked with there know that, well, while we were there, know that the fight back needs to be even stronger once Trump comes into office. The Standing Rock, I think there's a real potential for a democratic, democratic united front to defeat this pipeline and many others. Several water protectors have said, once we kill this black snake, water protectors need to fight other pipelines around the country such as the, there's a proposed Line 3 in northern Minnesota, there's a pipeline in Florida and New Mexico that, that people know of. Um, I'm sure there's more where that came from. So people know that this is a struggle that has to continue and it's about stopping the pipeline but also reclaiming indigenous rights and lands. People talk about really the importance of speaking out on climate change and the big money and big oil that is destroying the planet. Um, one of the Native men that I interviewed said there are two people, two people that are in charge of our lives right now. It's Kelsey Warren and President Obama. Um, so he, I mean, he knows clearly who the, who the enemy is. So I think, so the potential is there, but the work has to continue. It's not been, not been an easy road to, to build to this point for water protectors at Standing Rock, but um, if it's going to be successful, that, that effort has to continue, and we can do what we can um, to support that. So after having been at Standing Rock, I really am inspired. I have no doubt that with the militant leadership of indigenous people and the rest of us standing strong in solidarity, we keep up the fight, we can actually win this. So thank you.